Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Rekindy. I'm your host, Alexa, and today we're thrilled to introduce you to a trailblazer in the field of bioethics, Dr. Francoise Baileys. With over three decades of experience, Dr. Baileys has made a tremendous impact on the world of bioethics, policy, and healthcare. Born in Montreal, Quebec, Dr. Baileys is a first-generation Canadian. Her father immigrated from England, her mother immigrated from Barbados, and she grew up with a keen interest in justice issues. And at the university, this interest turned into a formal studies in philosophy and applied ethics. Over the years, she has held numerous academic positions and has been a prolific uh, writer and speaker, contributing to important natural and international policy discussions and debates. Her work encompasses a wide range of topics, including the ethics of assisted reproduction, research involving embryos, and the societal implications of engineering biotechnologies. Dr. Baileys is also a passionate advocate for public education, engagement, and empowerment. She believes that voices of all stakeholders should be heard in shaping science and healthcare policies. So thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. Great. Thanks for having me on the show. So um, just to begin, what initially got you interested in bioethics and how has your perspective evolved over the years? Well, I think I've basically always been interested in issues that have to do with justice. And so in the context of that sort of orientation, very often, you know, you would hear about something happening in the world and you think, well, that doesn't seem right. Or, ooh, I don't think I agree with that. And I would have said, honestly, like in the early days, a lot of my writing was motivated by the fact that I was being exposed to either a way of thinking or a way of being in the world that I thought was deeply problematic. And so this was an opportunity for me to sort of weigh in and offer a different perspective. So I think that's one of the things that is really wonderful for me. So philosophy for me is about the joy of thinking and, you know, trying to sort your way through certain kinds of problems. But my work is really at the intersection of that kind of thinking work and practice and specifically policy making. And so I try to take that um, out into the real world. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, so your work covers a wide range of topics in bioethics. Which areas have been the most challenging or thought-provoking for you and why? I think I've always been very interested in the question of personhood because for me that's a moral term. It's a term that we typically apply to some humans. We say that they are persons and therefore in that context They have a right to life or we owe them certain kinds of considerations. And for me, one of the things that's really interesting is why is it that some people conflate the term human and person? So they assume that all humans are persons and all persons are humans. And I think that there's reason to call that into question in both directions. I think it's quite possible to advance and defend the claim that some humans are not persons. Uh, They are biologically human, but they don't have the moral status of the person. And I think the same is true in reverse. I think there are some non-human animals that we might want to argue and defend the claim that they have that same kind of claim on us in terms of a right to life, a right to protection, et cetera, that we would typically, um, you know, restrict under the banner of personhood. So for me, that's been a really um, interesting and difficult challenge that's motivated a lot of my work. This is work around the moral status of the developing human embryo in the context of research. It's work around issues to do with termination of pregnancy. It's work to do with what happens to children uh, that are born into circumstances that are challenging and what it is that society owes to them. At the other extreme, I'm interested in asking questions about what it means to Um, use non-human animals solely for the benefit of humans. And you can think about that in the context of preclinical research. And most recently, you know, you can think about that in the context of xenotransplantation um, and thinking that it's okay to manipulate non-human animals um, in order to use them as organ donors for humans. So those are all very difficult and challenging questions, but what they have in common is this underlying set of conflicting views, values, beliefs around what makes a human protectable life and what makes a non-human protectable life. And I don't know if this is um, maybe too much of a um, broad topic to ask, but how would you define, where would you draw the line? And uh, like, how, 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 what are your views on that in terms of, should we be experimenting with embryos? Because I understand like with the vaccination, for example, um, uh, most vaccines, weren't they created from one single 
um, fetal experiment. Um, no, and I don't want to get sort of sidetracked yeah. down that because I think there's a lot of concerns about that. What is true is that some vaccines are made um, in egg, and for some people that's a challenge either in terms of um, allergic reaction or in terms of views and values around the belief of you know what is owed to non-human animals. But I don't want to get sidetracked into that. I think the thing that's really important is to appreciate when we look at a human embryo where you're looking in a typical context, their egg and sperm have met and fertilization happens. You then move from a one cell entity to a two cell, four cell, eight cell, 16, 32, et cetera. As this is happening, some people will argue that from the moment of conception, you have protectable human life. And some people will problematize that and say, well, when did you think conception happened? When the sperm you know, pierced the egg or when you had the marching of the chromosomes or when it started to divide. And so you'll start to get people problematizing that. Other people will then look at certain kinds of um, stages of biological development and they'll say, well, you know, 14 days is really important. Before 14 days, we don't have protectable human life, but after 14 days, we do. And in that context, very often what they're doing is they're pointing to certain biological phenomena. So, for example, up until 14 days, we have a phenomenon known as twinning. That's how you get identical twins. So basically that one embryo splits, becomes two, you've got identical twins. And some people say, well, humans can't do that. Like, I can't do that. I can't just split myself and become two. You can't split yourself and become two. So this thing, this embryo, which could do this and split itself and become two, it's clearly not the same thing as the beings walking this planet that we recognize as having moral status. So they're pointing to a biological phenomenon and saying, okay, it can't be one of us. The interesting thing is up until 14 days, embryos can also recombine. So they can split, called twinning, they can recombine, and you get a condition called fetus in fetu. And basically, the claim is humans can't do that either. We can't just sort of merge with another being and become from two into one. So then they say, well, 14 days must be really important. That's a demarcation line that we can get behind. So up until 14 days, you don't have protectable human life. But after that, you have one individual. You have an individual that's not going to join. You have an individual that's not going to split. It must be one of us. Now it has moral status. Other people will agree on 14 days, but they'll point to something else in biology. They'll say, no, 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 no. It's that on 15 days, you get the primitive streak. That's the precursor to the brain. What makes humans special is their brain, their rational capacity. So we'll err on the side of caution and we'll pick 14 days. Okay, so we're agreement. 14 days is the deciding line. But that's just one more thing. Somebody else would come along and say, no, it's not 14 days. It's not twinning recombination of the primitive streak. It's not susceptive activity. It's the ability to feel pain. It's viability. It's birth. And as you go down just the natural lifespan of the developing embryo through to the fetus, through the infant, different people, different cultures, different religions will point to different stages. And so for me, that's what makes this an interesting discussion debate. Do you think it's day zero? Do you think it's day 14? Do you think it's day 21? Like why? Um, and so in that context, uh, you asked me a question, where do, what do I think? Um, yeah, what are you saying? Where do you draw the line? Yeah, so I think that... Um, Line drawing is a very difficult thing to do, and I think I try to approach things a little bit differently. So I think it matters if the embryo is inside of the body or outside of the body in terms of its moral status, partly because if it's outside of the body, it actually can't go on to become one of us because it actually needs to be in a uterine environment. At least it needs to be in a uterine environment right now. Maybe eventually we'll have artificial wombs, but it actually can't become anything. So in that context, I place a lot of emphasis on potentiality. Does this ball of cells have the potential to become one of us? If it's in a Petri dish in a lab, the answer is no, it can't. So you could argue that all embryos outside of the lab are not protectable human life because they don't have the potential to become one of us. But some people would say that's not a good way to think about this problem because in fact you could take them and easily put them inside a woman's body so that they could become a human and that therefore you're actually exercising an unacceptable level of control and you have a moral obligation to do this transfer. But I would say if you think that there's a moral obligation to do the transfer, are you actually saying there's a moral obligation of women to accept this transfer? That's kind of contentious. Um, so I also think that 
what's most interesting, at least in terms of the work that I've done, is to draw this distinction between viable and non-viable embryos. That's work that I did in the uh, 1980s. And I introduced this concept and I defended the concept to say the non-viable human embryo could be a legitimate research subject. And the non-viable embryo is an embryo that for any number of reasons that have to do with the constitution of the embryo, not to do with human choice, right? So the example I gave you before, it's human choice not to transfer the embryo into an environment in which it could survive. But if you have an embryo that is defective in and of itself, so it doesn't actually have the wherewithal, even in an ideal environment, to become one of us, then I've argued it has no potential in that sense to become a member of our, our community. Um, so it might still be human, right? Recognized as having the right number of chromosomes, being of human egg and human sperm, et cetera. So we would say it's human, but it's not a person. It's not protectable human life. Okay, that's really interesting, and I can see how that's quite a multifaceted approach in looking at um, various avenues as to how that constitutes um, rights. Very interesting. Thank you for for sharing your views um, on that. And um, so, as a strong advocate for public engagement in science policies, can you share some examples where involving the public has significantly influenced decision making? Well, I think um, it's probably easiest for me to give you a couple of examples from Canada because I know them relatively well. And in this area that we've just been talking about, which overlaps with assisted human reproduction, um, in Canada, we had a royal commission that literally went across the country and solicited input from a number of different interested parties, including people who might use this technology, people who might offer this technology, just members of society that had views and values about whether or not a human embryo should be manipulated outside of the body, even in the context of pursuing a reproductive project. And what's interesting to me is that that ended up as a final report, a couple of volumes with supporting documentation, and that was used over more than a 10-year period to actually develop legislation. That legislation was brought into force, and today, um, years later, we still have that, if you will, codified. So the views of citizens in terms of what they thought was acceptable or not acceptable has in fact been entrenched in legislation. Now, it's a long time since then and not everybody agrees with the content of that legislation and some people are actively trying to change it. Um, and so a really simple example, which maps onto the conversation we were having before is that in Canada, like actually a number of other countries, there is a, a law in our case, in other cases, it's just a guideline, but there's a rule that says you cannot keep a human embryo outside of the body in a research context for more than 14 days. You actually have to legally transfer it, or you have to freeze it, or you have to discard it, et cetera, but you cannot keep it and continue to allow it to develop as a research project. So there's an example where the views and values of some people doesn't even matter what that was um, grounded in. It doesn't matter whether they thought it was twinning or recombination or precursor to the brain or anything, but they had this view. Other people had a different view, open debate, discussion, conversation, and that actually ends up entrenched in the law. And that law, is that, that, that over time would be malleable though. Like let's just say, for instance, um, a specific, and I'm not saying that there should be, but um, the, let's say at this, a specific time frame, people have a specific view and then over time they'd say, okay, maybe this isn't applicable. So it is always open to debate, always um, able to be challenged. And I guess the advantage of a dem democracy is that there are multiple minds working on this problem together in order to come to a common resolution. Well, I think what's really interesting about this is I would say to you right now that that 14-day rule around the globe is starting to come under pressure. So a number of people who would have supported it previously are today saying, no, no, we really need to be allowed to go beyond this. And they're arguing either for a different demarcation line or they're arguing for no demarcation line, that everybody should be allowed to do whatever they want. So people are positioned differently. Now, the thing about legislation is it does take more of an effort because of the processes required to change legislation. If this were merely a guideline, a research ethics guideline, for example, or if it was a regulation under a piece of legislation that was more open-ended, it would take less effort to change that law. So here, 
um, in this particular country, it would actually take a fair bit of effort. That's not to say it can't be changed. It is to say it's not going to happen in a, a quick and dirty kind of way. And that's why some people would consider it a success to have it be in legislation rather than to have it be in guidelines, whereas other countries have chosen a different route. Yep, yep of course. Interesting. No, well, that's, that's yeah. really great advancements and um, that's, that's good that it's protecting um, these embryos and, and future life. Um, so in your latest book, Altered Inheritance, uh, CRISPR and the Ethics of Human Genome, you talk about the ethical implications of using CRISPR in human embryos, germline editing, and the potential consequences of permanently altering the human gene pool. Do you want to talk us through right. that? Um, and how do you weigh up you know, the advantages versus the disadvantages? Right. So let me just explain a little bit um, the scope of activity that happens under the banner of human genome editing, because I think that'll be helpful for people to understand. So sometimes we do what's called somatic genome editing. And that basically means taking any of the bodies in your cell, sorry, any of the cells in your body. So it could be your skin cells, your liver cells, your hair cells that are, and making changes to the DNA in those cells. Now, the important thing to appreciate is if you do that kind of work, whatever genetic change you may succeed in making will not be passed on to subsequent generations. So those changes die with you. So if we were to be able to make a particular change, and it might be for an aesthetic reason, or people are always talking about things like eye color or hair color, it could be for a health condition. For example, you have sickle cell disease, and we think we can offer you somatic genome editing. Whatever changes are made, typically they're not going to be passed down to the next generation. The other kind of genome editing we talk about is germline genome editing. And your germ cells are basically your reproductive cell. So it's the gamete, the sperm, the egg, the precursor cells to the sperm and egg, and the very early stage embryo. If you make changes to any of those cells, which are your reproductive cells, but you make those changes and you keep that in the lab, so it's just germline, it won't have any impact in the world. And you might be doing that kind of germline research in order to better understand human reproduction, maybe make contributions to improving assisted human reproduction, maybe to develop better abortifacients because you now better understand how reproduction works. And that's germline genome editing. And then you have this third category, which people refer to as heritable human genome editing. And what's important there is the intent is, in fact, to make sure that whatever change is made, and typically these are changes made to the reproductive cells, so the germ cells, the intent is to take that manipulated gamete or that manipulated embryo, et cetera, and to transfer it to the woman in the hope of establishing a pregnancy and having a child that would have a genetically modified genome. That heritable human genome editing would make for changes in generation after generation after generation. So those are the three broad categories, somatic, body cells, changes die with the person, germline happens in the lab, but you're working with reproductive material, and heritable, you're working with reproductive material, you think you've made a genetic change, you transfer that genetically modified cell to a body, and you hope to have an offspring with that genetic modification. So. One of the things that's been super controversial is whether or not anybody should be making those kinds of changes, which will have an impact on the next generation. I've kind of positioned myself at this point to say, in the abstract, I'm willing to be persuaded that this is useful science that's worth pursuing. But I'm saying at this point in time, I can't see a robust ethical argument in support of that kind of research. And the reason I say that is, first of all, there are many potential harms associated with that, and we've not had a chance to talk through those harms and to fully understand what the implications are. And the other side of the harms is the benefits. And if you look at the benefits, the benefits that have been advanced, I don't think get anywhere near being weighty enough to take us down this path. So. Let me just very briefly then talk about what are these supposed benefits and what are the harms that I imagine. The typical benefit that people advance, and some people describe this as a compelling medical need, is that without this technology, 
there are people in the world who would not be able to have genetically related healthy children. So an example of that would be a couple where both parties have cystic fibrosis. If they were to meet and they were to fall in love and they wish to have children together, all of their children would have cystic fibrosis. Other conditions, or for example, still cystic fibrosis, but only one person has cystic fibrosis and the other one doesn't, when they make embryos, some of those embryos will be healthy and could be transferred, and they could have a healthy genetically related child. But like I said, there's this minority, and it's absolutely true. There are people in the world who, if they wanted to use their own genetic material with their chosen partner and their chosen partner's genetic material, they would not be able to have genetically related healthy children. I don't think that's a compelling reason. I don't think it's a compelling reason for lots of, of reasons, um, but mostly because I don't accept the argument that there's a right to have a child. I think having children is about responsibilities, not rights. It's about someone hopefully, willingly taking on the responsibility to care for another child. And so being oriented towards the other and trying to bring into the world and care for a young member of the community. That's not how this argument is presented. This argument's about me. I want to have genetically related children. And I think that I can understand the want, so I'm not disputing that it's a want and I'm not disputing that for many people it's deeply held. But I don't think society has an obligation to respond to wants. I think we respond to needs. And I don't think there, this counts as a need, right? And the reason I say that is there are many ways of becoming a parent, and I think it's wrong to reify the gene, to basically message people that the only way you can become a parent, a legitimate parent, is for you to have a genetic tie to that child, as opposed to you willingly taking on the responsibility to parent a child. And I think the reason that's so important is we, I think, as a society, have made tremendous progress recently in understanding that adoption is a very valid way of making a family, that other parenting is a very valid way of making a family, that being childless is a very valid choice for some people, that choosing to use donor gametes if you need to in the context of a particular reproductive choice is a very valid way of making a family, we have increased divorce and blended families. That's a very legitimate way of making a family. So I think it's really wrong to all of a sudden be turning our backs on the progress that we've made and to be insinuating that no, real families, real families, real parents have genetic ties. So I think there's a problem there of messaging that's deeply problematic. I think it's entrenching a false belief that you have a right to have children and moreover that you have a right to have genetically related children. I'm just not persuaded at this point that that's a sufficient reason to go forward. And I could talk about other things like opportunity costs. This is a very expensive technology to try to develop. We got a lot of problems in the world right now, and we could be talking about climate change. We could be talking about wars. We could be talking about famine. We could be talking about all kinds of things. And in my book, I argue that we really at this point should not be investing our time, talent, and treasure in this particular project. Okay, so those are the potential benefits that are articulated by people who advocate for this. And I'm saying back, it's an interesting argument. It's not a persuasive argument. Now, what I do say, and I did say it earlier today to you, I'm willing to be persuaded. You know, I could be wrong. And so in the book, I kind of had this little hypothetical. I said, well, if you were to tell me, you know, that look, with the climate problem, with the air pollution problems, et cetera, et cetera, life on this planet is just not going to be possible in a particular time frame. And then you said to me, that's Francois, that's why we need to do this kind of heritable genetic modification. We've got to change humans. They, we've got to change them so that they can survive this level of radiation, or we've got to change them so that they can drink polluted water, or we've got to change them so that they can, you know, survive without, you know, all kinds of meat-based protein or whatever your story is, right? If you say, look, Life on this planet is not going to support humans as we are currently constructed. Therefore, we need to change us. Then I would say, okay, well, so now that you've got me interested, so what are you trying to say? You're trying to say that humans should live forever, that Darwin was wrong, our species shouldn't die off. Maybe I'm okay. I could be intrigued, interested. 
But then what becomes really fascinating to me is like, would it just be easier to like not wreck the planet? Like, could we just maybe stop polluting it and stop doing all the other behaviors that would make it an inhospitable environment? And let's say you said, well, that would be the ideal world, Francoise, but in the real world, nobody's willing to give up their privileges. And so we're just like hell bent for leather going to end up in this place, which is that we will have a planet on which we could not live. I would still then come back and say, okay, well, if that's you know going to be the real world, are you sure that the best thing to do is to take the human and modify the human to live on this planet with all of its constraints? Or would you be better off to modify the human so that they could live in a spaceship? You actually need to have an answer to that question because if you're going to genetically modify humans, you need to know what environment you're modifying them for. You need to know that what's going to be a useful trait for them to have in order to survive. Well, nobody's actually talking about that. So what I'm saying is in the real world, you can give a concrete example. If you want to have genetically related healthy children, there's a subset of humanity that could not do that, but for this technology, that's true. I just don't think it's a good enough reason. A good enough reason might be survival of the species. It might be, but if you really want to advance that, then you have to tell me why we should continue to destroy this planet, why we should then choose to live on a destroyed planet, or why we should choose to get off this planet and live somewhere else. It becomes a much more complicated story. So let me just have two more minutes. Yeah, please. Great. So I told you a little bit about what are the potential benefits, and I tried to suggest not obvious to me that they're, they're great benefits. I do just want to very briefly mention, and I won't elaborate it on unless you think it would be helpful, I just want to name the potential harms. There are harms or potential harms to the infant, the genetically modified child, right? Things could go wrong. That's just a fact, right? So people talk about this, oh, it's a great big benefit, but well, you're assuming everything is going to work and it might not. And then the other thing I say to people is, you know what? Take a step back. How did you even get this infant that was genetically modified? Well, you actually had to put this genetically modified embryo into a woman. And you actually had to get egg and sperm. And it's pretty easy to get sperm. It's not so easy to get eggs. So the other thing I point to as a potential harm is, have you paid any attention to the harms that would be visited upon women that you would be asking to participate in the research necessary to develop this as a potential future intervention, right? It's not going to work the first time. It may not work the second time, the third time, the 200th time, the 2000th time. How many times are you going to go through this? These are all women that have to participate in your research, right? And they have to participate both in providing you with raw material, eggs, and they have to participate in becoming pregnant. And there are lots of risks still in parts of the world associated with pregnancy. But then there's also the potential harm to the woman and their partner. So now we're looking at the prospective parents. If, as I said, things don't go right, right? They now have to bear um, the burden of care and conscious, conscience and looking after this child. There are also, you know, potential harms for society. There's potential harms for the gene pool. And I could go on, but it's just to say, it's not an obvious thing to me that this is worth pursuing. Interesting. Yeah, and there's a few... Um... Points then. I loved how you went over, you know, these various different possibilities and these various different outcomes, um, and what's uh, some of the advantages um, versus the disadvantages. So, you know, with expanding um, life and how you were saying, if the planet becomes inhospitable and we end up um, having to travel to other planets in order to survive, or um, you know, survive better within this environment that no longer suits our needs. Um, one of the interesting thoughts on that is like, well, what happens if as we started to, you know, we, we started in maybe one country or a handful of countries and then we started to spread across the world and populate more and more and more. So it almost seems like our natural um, inclination is to expand and whether that's expanding into other um, continents, which is what we've done throughout Earth. And that's why humans have really adapted and evolved so much and expanded um, so much. Um, but what happens if that is embedded in us? And so it's the natural progression to go to other planets. Um, and one of the other thoughts I had as well with that is, uh, and I didn't really think about this too much before, but I can see the, the thought where, so as you stepped out of the cave, we started to adapt to our environment, right? And so there would always be that gene expression, our, our genes, um, epigenetics, it shifts based on our environment. 
And I, I've heard this argument with GMO food where it's like, oh, but, you know, we've been changing food for so long anyway. Like tomatoes were never this red or, um, you know, a lot of the fruit that we've been eating has been altered and food has been altered over generations from farming and changing how um, through uh, breeding processes as well. Same with cattle. So is this not something that we've been doing subtly anyway through so many, you know, hundreds of years? And all this is doing is elongating that but to a much more precise manner that I hear has serious implications particularly for gene drive or um, you know uh, passing um, things onto our offspring that could be problematic to the human species but similar to you know where where do we draw the line for life um, and and what is um, what constitutes as a human or personhood and what doesn't this as well as like at what point have we actually started to genetically engineer um, but through you know natural ways, I guess uh, natural selection or um, where where does that line where is that line drawn? And is this just one step a little bit further than what already was? I think it's different. I think you know the phrase I would use is the means matter morally, and you know you're absolutely right. There are lots of choices that people make that definitely have an impact on the next generation. Right, the partner you choose to have, you know sex with has an impact on the offspring. Um, if you have sex this month versus next month, you're actually going to be having a different sperm and or egg meet and possibly make a baby. So, you know, just the timing of when you choose to have sex would make a difference. Um, you know, you talked about gene environment interaction. If you happen to be in a wealthy Western context where your child is born as contrasted with a poor or um, developing context, your child's upbringing and opportunities will be different. Um, and in terms of gene environment interaction, for example, access to nutrition, things like that, their outcomes will be different. So there are lots of things we already do. There's no doubt about that, right? Um, and I was trying to say that some of them are not all nature, but they're very much the nature-nurture combination that will make for differences. But I think there's something very different in that kind of ways in which, yes, Small changes over time are being made by choices that humans make and what's being proposed here. Because what's being proposed now is trait selection. So it's actually looking at the traits that are out there in the world and saying, this is a good trait, we want to amplify it, this is a bad trait, we want to get rid of it. And I think for many of your listeners, they would at this point be saying, hey, wait a second, that sounds like something I've heard of before. And you know, in that context, people will talk about eugenics practices and how those are really very destabilizing, discriminatory, inappropriate, and we can add you know, to that list. But I think it's a very problematic path to willfully go down to basically, you know, with a certain amount of hubris, think that we know what are the right traits to you know, go out and to try to build the better human. And if you think about it, however long it would take us to perfect being able to do that, is that the trait that we're going to need by the time it actually comes into play? And I mean, you know, when I talk about this, I sometimes use silly examples, right? But people talk about height. Oh, height would be great. Or people talk about intelligence. Oh, intelligence would be great. Or people talk about aesthetics and beauty. Or they talk about, you know, uh, athletic prowess. I mean, we could go through this and I could talk to you about, you know, how these are very complex um, traits and it's not a single gene, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't even need to go into all that complexity. I just need to make the point why is it that you think you know what is a good trait? Because the trait is only a good trait in a particular sociocultural context. And a couple of examples that have been used are height, but another one that's often used in this space is deafness. So is deafness to be thought about as a disability and we really should make sure there are no deaf people in the world? Well, a number of people in the deaf community think of that very clearly as eugenics. You're basically trying to wipe out me and my community. I have a perfectly fine life. I have a language that's different from yours, but because of that, you don't think that I should be allowed to be in the world. And I think other people will tell you very clearly, if you start kind of eating away at the edges of the community by you know, persuading some people not to have deaf children or to um, you know, engage very early on in uh, changes, therapeutic interventions, et cetera, what you do is you make the community of deaf people smaller and smaller and smaller, and then politically it's harder and harder to claim your right in terms of the resources that you might need in order to interact in society. 
So I'm giving that particular example because some people have actually suggested using heritable human genome editing for this purpose. So it's not a hypothetical. It's been proposed as here would be a good use of this technology. And here you've had people respond and say, there's an important thing that you need to understand about diversity. Difference is not a disability. And that's just one kind of example I could give. You know, on a, a more humorous note, we could talk about height. You know, people say, oh, wouldn't it be great if all these people who are short could be, you know, taller? In fact, why don't we make them all tall enough that they could all play basketball? And then at some point you think, like, really? You want everybody to be seven feet tall? And then what are you going to do with all the doorways that are not seven feet tall? And then where's the competitive advantage of being a tall basketball player and everybody is tall? And, you know, you can just imagine. And, you know, again, you could make it be silly. But the point is that I want to underline is hubris of thinking that you actually know what are the right traits to promote and what are the right traits to avoid. And yes, I think we could probably do that with confidence when we're talking about something that's lethal and that will you know, have an impact on a newborn as opposed to even a late onset disorder. I think we could probably pretty easily start getting you know some agreement around that. But even there, there are people who might disagree and think it's really not for us to play God. And I think the thing that's interesting to me is how that phrase has become part of this conversation with people on the one hand saying, you shouldn't play God, and other people saying, well, if not us, then who? And have some of us been playing the devil, so we really should you know, aspire to be more godlike in our orientation. Um, so you're hearing that you know, using different kinds of words, but that's why like, I would sort of call for a little bit more humility and a little bit less hubris. And it's a really interesting discussion, particularly when you were talking about, um, you know, deaf people and, and hearing aids, because I can understand you would probably think, well, wouldn't you not want to, um, so somebody who's born with chronic pain or something, and you had to say to them, look, I could improve your quality of life by providing um, th this medication for hearing aids, you know, for, the, for uh, people who struggle with hearing, there's, there's hearing aids, so technology to help substitute that gap for them to have, um, you know, hear the birds singing or um, wh whatever sounds that we take for granted could enhance their quality of life. What if you had to say to somebody who yeah, is stuck in a wheelchair and, and in chronic pain and you had to say to them, look, I could actually have eliminated this from birth, that you never would have felt this. You would have been running with everyone. You would have not had this intense pain. Would they have taken it up? And, and with medication, are we not already doing that in a way? Are we not already starting to play God by providing, you know, kids with asthma, we can give them an asthma pump. Um, and I'm saying that that's a lesser degree of what we've been doing to alleviate a lot of the ailments that um, happen during birth and, and during our life cycle in order to create somebody that's more quote unquote perfect. Same thing with a medication, oh not medication, sorry, vitamins or minerals. People who are fully into the health scene have optimized their diet to um, elongate their life cycle or to make sure that their cells are dividing optimally. Um, would this not just be that one additional step? And I, and I hear that not playing God can be a very slippery slope. Um, but how would that interplay in? And, and would medication be, yeah, what we're already doing? Well, I think one of the things that's really important is um, the ways in which the person who would be um, seeking that gets to be part of the decision making, right? So you just said, if I have asthma, I'm in a lot of pain, and I say to you, I could offer you this treatment, then I can choose to say, yes, I would like it. No, I would. That's one kind of response. Another kind of response is you're actually saying to the person, wouldn't it be great if you weren't you? I mean, ultimately, that's what you're saying. And there's different ways in which that's true because whatever your challenges are in the world, and in some cases, they may be, they may be physical, but in other cases, they could be social, right? Like I'm born into a family with an alcoholic parent. My life would be a whole lot better if I didn't have an alcoholic parent. How are you going to treat me and make my life better? Ultimately, though, you might say, you know what? But you have become the strong force that you are in the world because you've had to have this environment and you used, you know, whatever your talents and strengths were to come out the other end and you were resilient, et cetera. And I'm not trying to make this be everything is wonderful and everybody should experience, you know, negativity in their life. I am just saying that we kind of have this naive idea that everything will be wonderful if we take away something that externally somebody else judges not to be um, a useful trait. And I think part of the reason I gave the example of deafness is we have had cases of couples who are deaf themselves 
who actually want to have a deaf child. And we have had people say, oh my gosh, that's horrible. You're actually trying to increase the probability that you would have a deaf child. And they're saying, yes, because that's how we live our life. And we would like to be able to interact, you know, fully with our children, et cetera. And the interesting thing is, you know, do you think that's a bad thing to want to have a child that's like yourself? And all of a sudden you say, well, you, no, no, it's okay. You can have a child like yourself, but not like this kind of yourself. Like not if you're a deaf person, you can't have a deaf child, but you know, if you're a blonde hair, blue eyed person and you want a blonde hair, blue eyed child, that's okay. So it's a really interesting thing, the way you're bringing prejudices um, to bear in a particular context. And I think the other thing to appreciate is even, you know, the examples that um, have been given, I do think, you know, there's a big difference between if you have been a hearing person and you've lost your hearing versus you've never had it. So you don't necessarily miss anything. Now, maybe you'll experience great joy when you have a new experience. I would experience great joy if I get a new experience, but that doesn't mean that I've lived my life to this age missing something that I didn't know I could have as an experience. And again, I think the most important thing here is to appreciate there is no one homogeneous, categorically right answer or perspective. I think all I'm trying to do is to say there are many different ways of looking at this and the one way that I think we ought not to do is to get very much early on entrenched in the view that we know with confidence what's a disability and who needs fixing. Um, and, you know, I think there are people who have different kinds of physical or other limitations who tell you their lives are fine. You're just making assumptions based on your life. Um, but that doesn't mean that they carry over for me. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not trying to say that all people in the deaf community think the same way. And I'm not trying to say that all people in the hearing community think this way. I am saying that we ought not to be confident that we know what's a good trait and what's a bad trait. That's not, it's very, that's, that's very true. That's very, very true. Um, and so how can we ensure that access to CRISPR based technology and technologies is equitable and doesn't widen existing socioeconomic disparities in healthcare? Um, I had a recent discussion with Joe Bayahaka and the founder of the Odin. Um, so what are your thoughts all around that? Um, so as we're talking about now, like some people may not want to be deaf. Um, some people may want to say, no, actually, um, let's just say in another country, uh, they, there's no regulation around gene editing. And they go, no, actually, we believe collectively that we want to have the superhuman race um, because we believe that's the next stage. How can you then, you know, would they not have a massive advantage? And how, yeah, how, how, how do you work that? Well, I think it's pretty clear that if this technology were ever to be developed and offered as a heritable uh, intervention, that it would only be available to the uber wealthy. I mean, it's going to be an extremely expensive thing. Uh, and I think that what you're going to see is that it's people who are already very privileged, who are going to want to take that privilege and now entrench it in their DNA. So I think we need to seriously think about what kind of world we want to live in. So when I say that and that phrase, it's actually very purposeful. In my book, at the beginning and at the end, I ask that question. I literally say, what kind of world do you want to live in? And it's only when you answer that question that you can then turn your mind to the next question, which is, and how will this technology, in this case, heritable human genomedic, how will this technology help me to build that world? And then I talk about the kind of world I want to live in. And for example, the kind of world I want to live in is a world that is more equitable and is more just. And I can't see a way that this technology would help to build that world. And so that's kind of my starting point. I think that, you know, one of the things we need to pay attention to is, again, what are the big picture goals and objectives? If you really want to build a better world, it becomes important to then think about what are the means you're willing to take to achieve that goal? So right now, there are people who have said somewhat facetiously, you know, there are too many constraints, there's too much legislation. Let's find a country where there's no legislation. The interesting thing is colleagues and I have done some empirical work where we've actually tried to get access to rele relevant documents in most of the countries in the world where we were able to get documents, looking at do you have laws, policies, guidelines, regulations, treaties, other documents that actually take a stance for your country. And one of the things that's interesting is that we have found not a single country actually overtly permits this kind of research. 
and all of the countries that do have anything to say about it, it's a prohibition. Now, we could come back to the beginning of our conversation. You would ask me again, well, can't those laws be changed? And the answer is yes, but it'll take time. And in that context, maybe we'll become a little bit more uh, clear in what our goals and objectives would be. But I think it's important to appreciate that this is not idiosyncratic views, that you literally have legal documents around the world um, in close to half of the countries in the world, um, you know, where they've expressed themselves and said, no, this is not acceptable. And one of the things I'd point out to you is that there's a lot of countries that don't have any documents, right? So if you live on a small island and your population is 250,000, heritable human genome editing is probably not something you're doing in your country. And so not surprisingly, you wouldn't have any legislation or documents around that. So you're really looking at the major countries. And if you take places in Europe, um, you have the Oviedo Convention, which a number of countries have signed on to, which clearly prohibits this. If you look at the United States, Canada, China, I keep naming countries, they have rules, regulations, guidelines in place that prohibit this. And part of the reason for that has to do with some of the harms that I alluded to. And those harms are narrow and they're broad. So it's for the individual, it's for the family, it's for society, it's for the gene pool. Well, that's interesting, actually. I didn't know that there was such a um, global crackdown on this. You know, I think my naive assumption was that there's specific countries that may um, be using that. I mean, I think I'd read an article vaguely, but I mean, look, even to this day and age, I'm always mindful what I read and how much I absorb with that saying that they were gene editing um, some of the soldiers um, in order for them to be better equipped within the battlefield. And, you know, you look throughout history as well as saying like, uh, what a lot of the advancements have been made in order to beat our opposition. Um, and then that, you know, in, starts to expand out into the population. Um, and so, yeah, well, I, I guess I also wonder what, how much is it that countries are saying, hey, we're banning this, but then on the sidelines, they may be still experimenting or doing their own thing um, in order to defeat the opposition. Right. So a couple of things I'd like to say in response. First of all, if anyone of your listeners is interested, you can actually get a copy of this paper because it's not behind a paywall. So even though it's an academic paper, it is open access. And you would just need to put in as keywords, the global policy landscape for heritable genome editing. And if sure to put my name in there as well, it'll help get you to that article. And it'll show you both, um, it'll provide all the numbers, it'll give you maps of the world, and it literally will give you a link to every one of those pieces of legislation. So if you didn't believe us, you can actually go and read the legislation yourself. So I think that's the first thing that you know I'd like to say. The second thing that I think is really important to appreciate is part of what matters is, again, from my perspective, what kind of world do you want to live in? And when I answer that question, one of my other answers, not just about you know being tolerant and embracing diversity and making for a more equitable world, it is also to say, I want to live in a world where we collaborate rather than compete. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about science is how much of that seems to be built on a set of assumptions that competition is good for knowledge production. I'm willing to call that assumption into question. I'm willing to suggest that maybe you'd be a whole lot better at knowledge production if you shared and if you collaborated. And in some way, we have a recent example of that. Think about the vaccine for COVID-19. Think about what happened in this context where there was a perceived global problem and people share in a very open way. Now, I'm not saying there's not a lot of problems with the way some of that science happened or didn't happen, but you did have sharing and it did accelerate the development of a vaccine. How many other things might we be able to accelerate if we had as a starting point collaboration, not competition? So, you know, I say that because I really believe in in what I said and in what the idea I developed in my book, which is to say, when you look at any technology, and we are going to be talking about artificial intelligence, we could be talking about nanotechnology, we could be talking about, um, you know, virology and, and, you know, gain of function in certain kinds of um you know, viruses, et cetera. We could be talking about any technology. But if you do what I say and you pull back and you say, okay, what kind of world do I want to live in? And engage the moral imagination. What does that world look like? And really, when you feel comfortable that, yes, I know what this world looks like, then go back and say, how will this technology help me build that world? And for example, you gave the, the idea about well, why don't we enhance our, our warriors? 
that's not a world that I can imagine counting or under the rubric of building a better world, right? Um, you know, and that's in a context where I'm not happy with the world that we live in, but I'm just not sure how using the technology to enhance warriors will make it a better world. Uh, and so I'm trying to think about different ways that we can use our knowledge uh, for the benefit of all. Yeah, no, I, I mean, look, in saying that, I'm not advocating that by any means. I was actually quite shocked when I read that. Um, and I had a chat to um, Margaret. She wrote this beautiful book um, that NATO um, heavily recommended um, was just all talking about all the possibilities of mass destruction and what are we currently doing um, globally and, and you know, how the more advanced we become and the more competitive we become, the more likely it is that we could, you know, self-destruct or it could be quite detrimental uh, to all of humanity. But, and, and, and some of that was, you know, talking about nanotechnology, of course, and talking about even gene editing. And that's why I was quite um, taken aback when you said, oh, no, there's, there's these um, global policies that are prohibiting this. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting because that doesn't um, correlate with some of the threats that are being foreseen. Um, so, you know, there's always vicious intent and there always has been vicious intent. Unfortunately, we live in a world where not everybody cares about their fellow neighbor as one would love. Um, and, and I would love to live in a world where we were all collaborating collectively. I think it would be amazing if we used all of our um, technology in order to advance to potentially other planets rather than destroying oneself. Um, so I completely agree with you. I'm just so curious as to when you have specific societies that pr prohibit something and you potentially have other societies that elevate that, what social disparity would that have? But is that even a really good debate to say, oh, well, if my friend does it, I want to do it too, uh, even though it's really harmful um, or could potentially be harmful. So, And then that's why I've, I've had these conversations with so many people, because I just think it's so interesting. On one side, you could really enhance one's quality of well-being. And I understand your debate to say, well, what is enhancement? Are we not already living our highest self? as we were born to be. But then there's another argument to say, well, you know, I'm in chronic pain or I'm, I'm and, and then you also have technology now that is being accelerated where you can have robotic hands, you can have robotic eyes that you can see through walls. I mean, uh, there's possibility of people living 10, 15, 20 times longer than we ever have before. And with previous medication that has slowly elongated our lives from 40 years old to 50 years old to 60 years old to 100 years old, is that not a natural trajectory. So I feel like I'm sitting on a fence that's like, on one side, I can see this natural um, trajectory that maybe this is just the next step. And on the other side, it's like, well, no, this really is not something that we should engage in because um, who's to say what is correct and who's to say what is right and what is wrong. Um, and maybe you could yeah, have cool. wealthy people that, sorry, um, you know, if you had the, the extremely wealthy people that have edited their bodies anyway, let's say through... Um, Let's use Kim Kardashian, for example, the, the plastic surgery and whatever to project herself as the ideal female figure, not saying that she is. But w one could argue, well, her friends and family could potentially, since they've already modified their body so much, they would just say, oh, well, this is just the next step. I'd want my child to live for 300 years and be an ideal, perfect human. And that child may more likely get top possibilities in life, you know, may get better opportunities. Um, and what does that even look like? Yeah, well, I, again, I would sort of approach this and, and respond in a number of ways. I think it's absolutely true that we value enhancement. In, in a generic kind of way, we value enhancement, right? Why do we send our kids to school? Why do we give them piano lessons, right? So there's a lot of ways in which we clearly, as a species, value enhancement and we're trying to make ourselves better. And, you know, you could give the example of cosmetic surgery if the person thinks that that makes them better. So in and of itself, that's not my concern. My concern really is in the assumption that we actually understand what the perfect human would be and that when we go back, start building it. And I'm saying we haven't had any kinds of conversations about that. We have a lot of assumptions and a lot of those assumptions are the assumptions of the powerful. And the powerful amongst us may not actually have the best perspective on what would be a useful trait. The second thing to say is that Many times people think about, you know, manipulating biology as if this is an engineering problem and they can get it right. That's not how biology works. And you could do all kinds of things and think it's very precise and you know exactly what it's doing and it will change itself. So again, I think that's why I keep trying to point out the hubris 
um, in terms of thinking that you know what the perfect human would be and that you think you could achieve it. I think that, you know, what we need to do is have many more conversations, kind of like, you know, what this podcast can spur, right? People can agree with me or disagree with me and then have a conversation. That's what I'm about. And I've talked about this um, in terms of consensus building. And in that context, what I think is interesting is I believe that what we need to do is move ourselves through conversation, discussion, debate towards a place where we have more in common than we have disparities. Are we all going to come to agreement on something? Maybe not, maybe never. But when I talk about consensus, I say this is about unity, not unanimity. This is about bringing people together and not really even making sure that all persons are together, but rather that all ideas are on the table. And right now we live in a world where people who have more power than others control the ideas that get to be out in the world for debate and conversation. So I want to have a space for us to start having this conversation and not to make assumptions about we know what's good or what's bad for us, for our neighbors, for other cultures, etc. I did say earlier on that the arguments that I hear today for why this is really good, important science and we ought to invest in it, I've said those arguments don't persuade me because they're basically saying that there are people that want genetically healthy related children, they can't have them, therefore we should make sure we do this. If you actually look at the science, you would be helping very few people. If I take the example of cystic fibrosis, you would be helping one couple every 15 years. Okay. I mean, people don't get to hear these numbers and to actually understand. And so I'm saying, you know what, we got a lot of other things we can do that are going to be more important. But I did say, and I meant it genuinely, I said, look, maybe one day somebody will come up with a better answer, right? And maybe then I'll say, oh, now this looks like really interesting science and we should pursue it. I don't see that now, but I'm not closing off that door. Why? Because I want to have a conversation. I want people to tell me why they think they should do this. And I want to be free to say why I think they shouldn't. And I want us to be able to keep talking. And I'm hoping that if everybody comes to that conversation, metaphorically, not thinking they're the only person with the right answer, we might all shift and move a little bit, right? And the fact of the matter is, we may never come to agreement. But what I say loudly and clearly is, we will be better off as a society for having tried. And if you think about what I'm describing, consensus building, we do that all the time. We actually do. We do that all the time. How do we do that? We live in families and we don't all agree with every family member. We have book clubs and we don't always agree with everybody in our book club. We have churches that we go to. We have all kinds of clusters where we manage through deep disagreement to hold on to whatever that community is, right? Now, my challenge is I don't know how to upscale that, right? But what I'm saying is we actually know it's important to do and that we don't want to live in every environment that's full of tension and arguing and disagreement. So how do we find the best of us and try to you know, bring that about in, in a broader kind of context? And I just don't want to give up on that possibility, right? I want to say it's possible. And then we can go right back to the beginning of this podcast where we talked about embryos and 14 days. And I told you that most countries either have guidelines, laws, regulations, professional societies say this, and it's been for a long time. The 14 day rule has been around uh, since the late seventies, early eighties. Now that's the consensus. How did we get there? Right? So there are ways of building a consensus. Now I told you also the 14 day rule is coming under pressure. There are scientists who are advocating very strongly that that's not the right demarcation line. We need to change it. And maybe in a few years, in my lifetime, maybe it will change. But even if it changes, it doesn't mean that we didn't have a consensus for a very long time that 14 days was going to be the right stopping point. And so all I'm saying is we need to work hard to keep avenues of conversation open such that people with different views and values can talk to each other and can genuinely listen and possibly be persuaded. So I would hope that people who don't agree with me would at least listen enough to understand why does she think this is not worth doing? Why does she think that we shouldn't invest all of this time, talent, and treasure so that we could offer once every 15 years a couple with cystic fibrosis a child that's genetically related to them and healthy? Maybe there are people that think that's worthwhile. 
I don't. Doesn't mean I don't show them respect and listen to them and then try to persuade them about a different perspective. Mm. No, that's that's very interesting. That is very interesting. And I'm um really just grateful to listen to um a different end of the spectrum um in order to come to once again a really good consensus. So um that is very interesting. And I, I guess I see and I'm just going back to um what we were speaking about before as well, is is I guess it's not it's from my understanding, it really is the potential to cure all diseases. You know, and I understand it was a massive controversy within the science field of um, that Chinese docs just going out and um, gene editing those twins to be um, uh, HIV immune. And then there was that Russian scientist afterwards who was wanting to do a similar thing. And um, yeah, I mean, living in a society where we've cured all diseases or potentially could cure all diseases, you would think would be most doctors or most uh, people within the medical field's dream. I mean, they've dedicated their whole lives to working on different ways to cure cancer and cure so many other different diseases that have harmed so many other families. And here there's a potential for that to actually come to flourishion. But with that, I understand it it can also harm um, and do a lot of detriment, particularly because we don't actually know how to do all those things just yet. So there would be a lot of trial and error where the consequences would be developing more cancer or um, you know, whatever other side effects could be a result of that. Yeah, well, I think um, it's never going to be possible to get rid of all illness or all genetic disease. Um, most of the things we're talking about are single gene disorders. They're not multifactorial. We haven't really spent a lot of time on gene environment interaction. I mean, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but, you know, you also, you know, have to appreciate that things will arise you know, de novo. So it's not all just about, you know, oh, two people have a genetic illness and the child will inherit it. You can just have, um, you know, some kind of um, mistake happen in the genetic code for, you know, a first instance. So, I mean, I think it's probably not ever going to be the case that we can imagine a world in which we are not going to have both genetic diseases and other things that will count as disability through trauma. So really what we need is to think about ways of being a more kind, caring society, understanding that there will always be some amongst us who are going to need the resources of the community in order to have a good life. Um, and I think that that's really you know where I would want to be putting a lot more emphasis is how is it that we, again, embrace diversity, difference, and try to make sure that people have access to the things they need in order to flourish. Yeah, and of course. And, you know, even in that regard, living in Australia, um, the government spends a large amount of money on NDIS funding, and that's for people who are um, mentally or physically disabled. And so there's a huge um, group of people who would work uh, in supporting those individuals. Um, So there is definitely that I see within Australia, and it does provide that sense of equality to help those in need. Um, and I can see the benefit um, in helping and, and providing, you know, an equal um, environment for those to thrive who, who need to. Um, so the next one um, I was going to ask is, I guess we've gone over that one. Uh, what advice do you have for aspiring bioethics, particularly those interested in contributing to the ongoing discussion surrounding CRISPR and other emerging biotechnologies? Would you more just stand what you were saying before was, um, we thinking about what is the future that we want to create and working towards that all. I think, you know, different people will just become passionate about different things. Um, I know that for me, it was really seeing things that I thought were about injustices that really directed my research. So, for example, I've written about the exclusion of pregnant women from research, and I've argued that that's wrong. Um, and that really the starting assumption that we are protecting women that by keeping them outside of clinical trials, in fact, ultimately harms women. Um, and so, you know, there you're taking a norm and you're trying to say, nope, I don't like the way the world is organized because I actually think it hurts women. Um, and so, you know, uh, another example would be um, a number of countries in order to increase the number of organs available for transplantation have argued to move from an opting in to an opting out system in order to increase the number of organs available. Again, I've argued that's really wrong. Why should people uh, assume that the state owns their body once they're dead? Um, I think that it's really important that people, you know, be educated um, and be able to make a choice. Now, I would encourage them to make a choice that would include donating their organs. So I share the goal of increasing Um, organs available for transplantation. I just don't share a commitment to that particular method, which is that basically the assumption is you're a donor. 
I don't want that assumption. I want to live in a different world. I want to live in a world where people get asked. And if they say no, that we offer them opportunities to become educated or change their mind rather than saying, nope, we're just going to take your organs. Um, and so those are the things that have motivated me. So I just look around what's happening in the world and do I see ways in which I think a particular part of the community is being harmed or hurt or disadvantaged? And then I try to address that in my own work. Wow, that's that's quite phenomenal, actually. I really like that approach because it makes you also, you know, when you read a lot of uh, news, which I understand is geared towards um, self-destruction or, or negative things that are happening in the environment, it can sometimes feel quite overwhelming, particularly with uh, the advancements in technology, AI, um, gene editing, you know, all these major topics. One thinks, wow, like what future are we going to live in? It looks pretty bleak. Um, but I really like this whole um, thought process of saying, all right, well, what is it about that future that I think looks bleak? And how can I change it to something that I think would look really nice? And, and what, what impact can I have in creating that future that I would much prefer to live in? And, and maybe if enough people think that way, rather than just saying, oh, well, it's out of my control. I'm not going to bother. Maybe we could shift right. the course of our future. So one of the um, things that guides my work, and I refer to it kind of as my professional mantra, um, is this phrase I have and that I teach around, which is um, what's really important or what my contribution I hope uh, can be is to make the powerful care. And so when I say that, I'm saying, I understand that I alone can't make for this better imagined world that I had uh, in mind. But what I can do is I could try to find people that have more power than I do in the political system or in the science world or where have you and persuade them um, that this is what would help contribute to making a better world. And if I can help them to care about that, then they too will use their talent to help achieve that goal. Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, and so this might be a slight diverge in topics, but um, in your paper, I am who I am on the perceived threat of personal identity from deep brain stimulation. Um, you touched on the ethical concerns of uh, deep brain stimulation. So did you want to maybe elaborate on that? Because um, that was also what I was talking about to Margaret about recently was um, what impact that has. So I was just very curious to hear your thoughts on that topic as well. Well, one of the reasons I went looking at that particular topic was because many people thought that if you, um, you know, put this device into people's brains, that the, you would be changing their um, identity and their personality and things like that. And so I went into this trying to articulate a view that says, look, there is no true self. There is no authentic self that is being hurt or disrupted by this technology. What there is, is a self, and the self is a continuum. And I talk about this as a, a narrative, and that who you are in a way is some of your stories that you're able to tell, but it's also the endorsement that you get and the contributions that you have from others. So, I mean, you have a story that you can tell. Um, and it might include things that you've been told about what you did when you were a baby that you actually don't really remember, but you've incorporated that into the story. Oh, yes, I was a very colicky baby, right? Well, that's not your story, but of course it's your story. But somebody gave you that piece of information you've incorporated into your life. My view is that as you live your life, you continually add these various threads. Um, and that, that's what makes you who you are today. Um, and so in that context, I suggested, and I still believe, that identity does not rest in your brain or even in your body, but it's actually outside there in the world. So my identity is being constantly negotiated with all the people I interact with. It's being negotiated right now between you and I, right? Like you have a certain perception about who I am and what I do and whether what I'm saying is making sense or not. And over time, you give me feedback, uh, you know, that what I'm saying does or doesn't make sense. And I respond to that feedback. And if I think that, oh, she must think I'm daft. Okay, well, let me just try restating that in a different way so that she'll think I'm actually really smart or what have you. But we do that all the time and we just don't do it consciously. But we're, we are constantly negotiating how we are perceived in the world, how people react to us affects how we then try to reproject something out into the world. And then I have theories about how what becomes important to appreciate then is that there's no static self, that there can be radical disruptions, but along the way that would carry is equilibrium where you're pretty much happy with who you think you are and how the world responds to you. And that that's how we live our lives. Um, and in that work and some other work that I've done around identity, I actually advanced the claim that what matters is memory, 
recognition, and belonging. And that's ultimately who we are. And that the ways in which other people perceive us and respond to us very dramatically shapes who we are and how we can be in the world. Um, and so it's a it's an attempt to offer up a different kind of perspective on how we understand the self um, and how it is that the self is constantly uh, being reinvented through lived experience. Mm. That's really interesting because my, you know, understanding of the deep brain simulations, you could also alter because by stimulating specific areas of the brain, um, you can alter potentially their memories or their way. There's certain, like if you have a dopamine connect, you love being on your phone or you, or you, you enjoy taking drugs, let's say for instance, because that releases a huge amount of dopamine. You can start to rewire those brain processes. So the advantage of that is that you can, you know, no longer be addicted to being on your phone all the time or no longer be addicted to a specific drug. But if you can do that with those things, which is really positive, you could also do that with other things. So all of a sudden, wow, why am I um, so pro this specific politician? I have a huge dopamine rush every single time I see him and now I can't wait to to vote for him as a, just a, you know, a general example. So I can just see how that shift of... Um, understand that you are made up of what your memories and and who even those memories might not even be real memories they're just what other people tell you or each time I understand that you remember something you don't actually remember that actual memory if you're in a bad mood and you're looking back on your past um, experiences you may see that through the lens of the bad mood that you're currently in so that could actually slightly alter those memories so through brain deep brain simulation wouldn't that be doing that on a much larger scale that could well, I, I think that the examples you're giving are important, but I think part of what I was trying to do in that paper was to say that if you're ethically worried about what it means to kind of be stimulating parts of the brain, possibly changing behaviors, and we know that it does change certain behaviors, part of what I was trying to suggest is what you should be worried about is not identity, right, but agency and autonomy and who's controlling what is or isn't happening. So part of what I was trying to do there is to pull those ideas apart right? And the reason I'm saying that it's not that it's your identity that's changed is, you know, if your identity changes, I could go back and say, oh yeah, well, you know, your identity changed when you got divorced or your identity changed when you had that traumatic accident or your identity changed when you became a mother and became pregnant, right? Or, I mean, there are many ways in which you can have uh, a massive event that changes something in you. But what I'm saying is that that's just enriching who you are today. It's just part of your identity. So you are now a person who has consented to having DVS implanted and you're going to go on and you will be a person. The person that's you is the whole life trajectory. You didn't all of a sudden become a different person. And if you did, then you would literally have to say all of those massive kinds of events and the world made you a different person, right? That to me just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I just don't see why we want to buy into the idea that there's this core true self that we have to go looking for. I think we are constantly changing, constantly um, taking in information, trying to get the world to respond to us in different ways, et cetera. And what I think is important and potentially threatening about something like deep brain stimulation is, do you have control still? Because in the other cases, we still imagine that you have some control, right? So maybe you didn't have control by getting divorced because your partner wanted to divorce you, but you then had some control in terms of deciding, how am I going to behave around that or what kind of supports am I going to go look for, et cetera. The worry that people have with deep brain stimulation is like somebody else is controlling me through this apparatus. And so it's really an attempt to say, here's an example where we got the problem wrong. So if you're providing solutions and you got the wrong question, you're actually not going to advance the debate. And part of my work in that paper where I said, I am who I am, it's like, look, I just am who I am. Like, this is me. And the me today before you is not the me you would have met 10 years ago. But that doesn't mean I'm a different person. And I didn't have to have DBS for you to say, yeah, I continue to transition and I will until the day that I die, right? And I was trying to say the problem's not identity. The problem's not personality. The problem is agency. And what is it that people might lose um, around agency? Yeah, that's, that is a very, very valid point and very valid way of looking at that. And addressing that issue because I do, um, I am slightly concerned about about the outcome of those. Uh, and once again, same thing. Oh, it could really help. Even 
um, if you're stimulating areas within your body, like you're struggling to walk and you could um, enhance or your, your motor connection, you can enhance the, that, that brain body neural pathways. Phenomenal. Uh, but then the downside is uh, what other things are being altered without you even being aware of. And um, <laughs> who are you voting for without even realizing? <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, very, very interesting. Um, and so um, looking ahead, what do you believe will be the most pressing ethical dilemma in the next 10 years? And how can bioethics help navigate these challenges? Yeah, I, I don't actually think I can really answer that with any kind of confidence. And the reason I say that is because... You know, I think, you know, we're seeing more and more technologies come on stream. They are getting more and more complex, and we're going to see certain kinds of convergences and other kinds of synergies. And I don't even know what our next challenge is really going to be. Um, you know, is it going to be, you know, something to do with artificial intelligence and the healthcare system? Or is it going to be, you know, something to do with, um, you know, dual use research of concern because, you know, people are, are perhaps trying to manipulate viruses, they say, in order to anticipate the next pandemic, but maybe it could be to cause the next pandemic. So, I mean, I don't know that there's any one thing um, in terms of an area of science that I would point to, but I think what I would say is what's in common right now, vis-a-vis -vis science and a whole range of technologies, um, is an increasing lack of trust. And so if I can, rather than naming an area of science, I would be naming a challenge that is shared by a lot of areas of science right now that I think that's what's really important is if we live in a world where people don't trust science as a, a way of producing knowledge, sharing knowledge, and that for most people having an orientation towards the good and trying to make this a better world for all of us, then that's going to be our biggest challenge. Um, I don't know how to live in a world where you're not going to trust science. That's very true because, and particularly with COVID, we saw that massively is, um, oh, well, do I trust the scientific paper? Do I trust um, what the government is telling me? Do I trust the people who are advising the government? Um, I saw that, and I wasn't the only one. I mean, I'm sure that rippled across societies, particularly the Western society, massively. So um, that is very interesting, very interesting, and to see where that leads. And I, I do also understand, I'm um, just touching on that briefly, is like um, there's a, that, that big debate, say, well, who's funding the research where it's like um, when you look at specific, if it's government funded, okay, you know, it's got the best outcome, but sometimes companies are funding specific research in order to um, get a specific outcome. And um, yeah, I, I find that very interesting, and hopefully there's more of a crackdown on that. But I also do get that's why it's peer reviewed and, and hopefully that peer reviewing process is done um, in the best possible manner so that we do have some sense of confidence and trust that we can always fall back on because we're all subject to bias. And as we're becoming more and more heavily manipulated by those who have money and power and influence um, and want to potentially cause division within our society, if there's a way that we can unify and trust something. So I completely agree with you. Completely agree. Right. And so if you, being a podcast, I'd love to ask, um, if you had one message to share with the world, what would that be? Commit yourself to making the world a better place for us all. And it really is the us all that matters in that sentence. I think we have too much of us and them, and we are constantly othering and looking for division. And I would like to encourage a reorientation, um, you know, so that what we're looking for is what we have in common, the ways in which we can help each other things that would make it a better place for all of us. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been a really insightful conversation that I've thoroughly enjoyed. And um, guys, please go check out her book. Um, it's definitely worth uh, a read. And I'll link the global policy landscape in the description below um, so people can find it. Thanks for your time. Great. Thank you.